A reading from Matthew. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached him and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. If, any, if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth comes into, enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This is what defiles, for out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But eat with unwashed hands, to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon, but he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. And he said, I was sent, he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. And he answered her, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. I truly miss you. I miss being together at church. I miss seeing your faces. I miss hearing your chatter before and after church. I long for when we can be together again. Thank you for showing up. Once again, um, the gospel reading um, this morning left me clueless. I don't know what to do with Jesus calling a desperate Canaanite woman a dog. Um, it sounds a little bit like a racial slur to me. I'm sure it wasn't, but I don't know how to explain that. And if you have trouble with this, do as I do and ask rock. I like that phrase actually, ask rock. I kind of say it over and over again when people ask me questions and I would just toss out an idea while we're apart how about if we write our questions into Rock and he gets to choose one or two and answer them in the newsletter each week? He can sort of fill in his spare time with things like this. Um, so just ponder it if you want. I think it would be kind of fun. Um, what I do want to speak to you this morning about is prayer. The phrase in our Isaiah reading, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. I'm no expert on prayer. I can't tell you how to pray or what to pray because I can't tell you how to be you. And prayer is something that is very personal. It is also corporate, but it is also a very personal self-expression between you and God. What I can say is, is that prayer is important. God wants us to talk to him. God wants us to pray to him. It is at the heart of why he created us in his own image. Use the prayer book, use other means, listen to other people's voices or advice on prayer by all means. But at some point also put these things aside and in your quiet, times alone with God, use your own voice to speak from your own heart 
to God directly, however you feel prompted, whatever you want to say, it's okay. It does not have to sound like the prayer book. All it has to sound like is you. Give thanks. <clears throat> Get in the habit when something delights you as you walk in the woods, a wildflower. Just marvel and say thanks. Or when you see, um, when you have a wonderful conversation with a friend, these are gifts from God. Let us get in the habit of saying thanks. And they're just, as part of our normal sort of internal dialogue, share these thoughts with God. <clears throat> I use the Lord's Prayer in my devotions, at least on good days, um, as a way to focus and organize my unfocused and disorganized brain. Um, I take each phrase of the Lord's Prayer as sort of a heading and I fill in under it. I begin with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I pause and try to hallow his name. That means I try to still my mind. I just sit in silence and reflect on who I'm talking to and pause and let that sink in. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I'll get to that in a minute, but that is a whole heading of how I pray for the needs that come before me. Give us this day our daily bread. That means whatever is worrying me, whatever my needs are, and I typically am not worried too much most days I've never worried about my daily bread. I've never wanted for food, but there are a lot of people who do. So I tend to make that a corporate request. Give the people of this earth today what they need to live, dear Lord. Forgive me my sins or trespasses as I forgive those who sin against me. This, on the other side, there's usually a full list of things that I need to ask forgiveness for. Name them specifically and ask forgiveness. And then pause and say, as I forgive those that sin against me. And just pause and see if something comes to mind, something that happened yesterday, or last week, or perhaps years ago, and let it go. Forgive that offense, forgive that person. When I first started doing this, it was amazing the things that surfaced from my past that came to mind when I paused at this point in the prayer. And I would forgive them and let them go. And a lightness of being began to grow in me. And it changed. Forgiving others is a gift to ourselves, not just to that other person. It is not an obligation. It is a joy and a blessing to let go of the offenses that we accumulate and the burden, the weight that they place on us. <clears throat> Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. Lead me not into temptation. Lead me somewhere, Lord. Lead me into your will, away from the things that are harmful for me, into the things that I should be doing this day. Deliver me and my loved ones from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. End your time of prayer with just recognizing who God is, that he has won the battles that we're in the middle of each day, that we will be safe and we will be with him forever, and that he will turn things right in the end. When we pray this way, it's transformative. It's a daily sort of 
bathing of our souls in the truth and presence of God. <clears throat> I believe that there is a further work of prayer that the church is called to. Um, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And I'd like to zero in on this. And one way to get at this question is one of my big questions anyway, is how can there be such evil and suffering in this world that is looked over and governed by an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God? How can you have these two things simultaneously? How can both be true? How is it that both can exist together? This is an abstract question that the church and theologians have been wrestling with as long as there has been theology and the consciousness of God. And the answers, um, the abstract answers don't do much for me, to be honest. I think there are probably some good ones. There are certainly some bad ones. But as I've noticed in the Bible recently, the Bible does not seek to answer this question. How can there be an all good, powerful, loving God and evil on the earth? In fact, I think that this is the lesson of Job. Job asked this question and his friends tried to answer it. And his friends were wrong. And God was not pleased with the friend's answer. I think in a way, the Bible teaches us that there is no answer, or certainly no easy answer for this question. The terrible things that happen down here on the earth and the existence of an almighty, all good, all loving God in heaven seem to me to create a gap, a tear, in the fabric of the universe. What I believe is, is that the Bible shows us that prayer needs to fill that gap. That is what the Old Testament did in the prophets. That is what the Lamentation Psalms do. Like Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is no answer to that question. Jesus prayed that question from the cross himself and got no answer. Most powerfully, I think we can feel this disconnect with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he prayed, he filled this space with his prayer. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, thine be done. I think that is a prayer we are called to, to. God did not answer that prayer. God prayed that prayer. God asked that question. I shudder at the thought of God the Son asking God the Father in those heartbreaking words to let something pass from him and the answer being no. Think about that. God does not ignore the sufferings of this world. God drank them. God put them in a cup and drank them. This is the space prayer occupies, taking our anguish and voicing it to God. One of my heroes in the faith is a woman named Amy Carmichael who lived in the mid, early to mid 20th century. She was an English woman, young, felt called to be a missionary to China, got on a steamer, went to China, 
and on the way got some sort of sickness that meant that she could not get off the boat in China and fulfill her calling and stayed on the steamer as it went back towards England. There was a layover in India and she was well enough to get off the boat and something happened in India where she saw the need of those people. And she called, she went into prayer and she said as she prayed for whatever she was seeing in India, um, it was as if she entered the Garden of Gethsemane and felt what Jesus felt, the need for the lost and the suffering of this world, just for India. And she said it was crushing her. It was too much for her. She had to ask him to stop. But that was her call. She never left India. And she ended up establishing an orphanage for children that in that day were offered to Hindu temples to become prostitutes in some weird thing that they did. And she was key in ending that practice that was largely secret um, in those days. Um, at the height of it, she had over a thousand children um, that she had rescued sometimes at great risk. It began with prayer, a sense of a need of the suffering of the world. When we take these needs to God in prayer, be on the lookout. He might tap you to do something about them. The second big question I have is how is God a ter accomplishing his purpose in healing us, in creating us, I mean? How is um, he building his kingdom on the earth today, right now? <clears throat> how does God build, bring about his will on earth among a people that he has granted freedom freedom of will, freedom to oppose him. How does he do that? I think that is the job of the church as well. And he's, it starts with prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is the prayer that he has given to us his people to pray. And I think it is critical and God establishing his will on earth and accomplishing his, his purpose. The Bible begins and ends with a picture of the Holy Spirit, and I believe the Holy Spirit in prayer. The Spirit of God brooded over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And then at the end, there's this wonderful verse, the spirit and the bride say, come. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And then there's this wonderful reference to the Holy Spirit in Romans 8, where it says the spirit himself brings intercession for the saints with groanings too deep to be uttered. When we take up the prayer for God's kingdom to come, I think we're entering into a conversation that exists within God. The spirit brooding over the face of the water, it seems to me is God, the spirit seeing the need, seeing the possibility and God answering. The spirit I believe still broods over the earth. And that brooding, dear friends, takes place in you and me when we find that something crosses our path that hurts us because it's wrong, because it's unjust, because it's people suffering, and we feel it intensely, that may be the Holy Spirit in you brooding with words too deep, groans too deep to be uttered. Give voice to those prayers. Give voice to that anguish and pray for God's kingdom to come to that situation. Notice what those things are. That is God calling you to prayer. That is God's calling you to pray for his kingdom to come into that situation. And 
for his will to be done on earth here. It's important work, dear friends. I could tell you stories of groups, two that have been published in a book. Um, one of a man named Reese Howells in Wales that was called to intercessory prayer and, and a group gathered around him. And one morning they woke up and in their daily morning prayers, this agony fell over them that they did not know. They just sensed that something terrible was getting ready to happen. And the next day they realized that Dunkirk was happening to be. And they prayed um, and the rescue of the army at Dunkirk was, was prayed for by a group of people in Wales, not even knowing what they were praying. I heard a man describe being a speaker at a conference on prayer in Jerusalem when the Yom Kippur War broke out and they were trapped. They couldn't leave the country and that was the war that threatened to undo, to annihilate Israel. And instead of talking about prayer, they realized they were being called to prayer. And there were amazing events of how they prayed and how it seemed that they could see answers. This is not my experience and it's not most of our experience and there have been way many more prayers that don't seem to get answered than do. We have to not let that discourage us or keep us from asking God to move on this earth to fix the things that we see that need fixing. Who knows? Maybe that is how God's kingdom will come. Let us give ourselves to this call and ministry. The world needs us to be praying. Amen. Thank you for coming.